Okay, so good morning to everybody. Uh, just to let you know that uh, the meeting is being webcast on YouTube and the County Council website, which will be uh, available for future viewing if anyone wishes to do so. Um, I'll now start by, well, no, I'll ask Katie to go through the list of members. I think we're all here, um, but I'll ask you to go through them just to confirm that you should be here for all of the items. And if you leave at any time for any of the items, you can't vote on that item. So Katie, I'm here. Do you want to go through the rest of the members? Yes, so um, at the meeting we have Councillor Carter, Councillor Mark Cooper, Councillor Rod Cooper, Councillor Alexis McAvoy, Councillor Jane Frankham, Councillor Andrew Gibson, Councillor Powell Hare, who's um, a deputy today, Councillor Keith House, Councillor Gary Hughes, Councillor Wayne Irish. Um, then we have Councillor Neville Penman, Councillor Stephen Philpott, Councillor Roger Price, Councillor Lance Quantrill, and Councillor Jane Warwick. And we're all here. Yes, that's right. We just have apologies from Councillor Dibbs today. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, just to remind you that decisions will be made, have to be made in due course on items six and seven. Um, it's normally, or it can be reached through a roll call vote. We'll see how the items go during presentation and debate, and it may be that we can deal with it in another form, uh, depending upon how, how the, the item goes. So I'd like to remind you that, uh, um, that your microphone should be muted unless you're speaking, and that you should um, be present at all times during the item, uh, and if you're not, then you should let us know and um, and, you, and make sure that you do not vote on that item. Um, so can we move to the agenda, Katie? Apologies, I think the only one is Councillor Dibbs and uh, Councillor Hare is substituting. Yes, that's right. Yeah, declarations of interest. Uh, we normally disclose any declarations when we get to the item in question. Uh, is there any anybody want to declare anything now? Okay, no. Um, minutes of previous meetings, of the previous meeting last month. Do any members have any comments on the minutes? Are they a correct record? No comment, so we move on to item four, to receive any deputations understanding order 12. We've got five deputies this morning, um, two on the first item, three on the second item, on item seven, uh, in one of those is County Councillor Kemp G. Uh, they'll all be entitled to up to 10 minutes each, as you know. Um, so moving on swiftly to item five, just to remind you that uh, there will be a training session, uh, which I've requested on waste sites, uh, and that will be on Friday the 27th of November at 10 o'clock. Um, it's to go through the types of waste sites that we have in Hampshire. There are many of them. Uh, and there are some important items coming to committee, so it's essential that we know the exactly what each site does. And I think we will all gain more knowledge as to their operations, so please do attend. Um, the other thing is, I'm sure most of us attended the training session or the members briefing last week and Chris gave uh, an outst I thought outstanding um, presentation on the white paper. Um, could I ask that you, um, you, you'll have received a form asking for comments, um, which went through, came through yesterday. If you haven't done also already, could you uh, just fill in that form and send it back to see what your feelings 
were as to each of the items which was presented last week. So that's my only announcements. And so we move on to item number six, which is the A303 IBA recycling facility at Barton Stacey. This is an application to increase temporarily the amount of IBA which is delivered to the site. Currently, it stands at 180,000 uh, 180, tonnes per annum, and the, oper and the operator has made application to temporarily increase it to 205,000 tonnes per annum. This is because they've won a contract in Kent. Because of COVID, things have been delayed and they wish to bring the uh, IBA from Kent over to here up and until the site in Kent is up and running. Um, and it's a temporary application up to the end of next year. Uh, David Smith is going to present it. So over to you, David, if you'd expand and set out the full details of the application and the key points to be considered. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Good morning, members. Um, thank you for that introduction, Chairman. Um, I'll just share my screen. And hopefully you can all see that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, well, as uh, Councillor Latham has already mentioned, uh, this application is to allow, or well, is a variation of condition 14 of the existing planning permission to allow a temporary increase in the annual throughput at the A303 IBA <coughs> recycling facility. Um, there are no other operational changes proposed, um, and it's come to committee at the request of Councillor Gibson. Now, you're probably all aware of the site anyway, but um, just to give you a quick location, it's about eight kilometres southeast of Andover, halfway between the villages of Long Parish, a couple of kilometres to the north, and Bath and Stacey, a couple of kilometres to the south. The A303 itself runs to the south of the site with the slip roads on the junction very close to the site. The A34 runs to the east of the site. Uh, the operational area of the site uh, is the, the central couple of hectares of the within the red line. Um, it's surrounded by landscape buns on all sides. Immediately to the south is the A303 materials recycling facility, and the access to both sites on the Hall Road is via the A303 off the slip roads and then onto the Barton Stacey Long Parish Road. The land to the north of the site is a, a, a solar panel farm and the nearest residences are approximately 450 metres to the east and 600 metres to the southwest. Now the site does have a liaison panel and the last meeting was actually held on the 9th of September. <coughs> Now, the proposal is to allow uh, an extra 25,000 tonnes of IBA to be imported this year and next year, increasing the total throughput to 205,000 tonnes per year until the end of December 2021. The applicant has um, acquired the contract to handle the IBA from Kent and is in the process of finalising the planning permission and EA permit for a new facility in North Kent. Unfortunately, as uh, the Chairman has mentioned, due to the pandemic, pandemic um, this process has been delayed and this is not now expected that the construction of the site will be completed until July next year. So in the interim, the applicant wants to import 105,000 tonnes of IBA here with the same amount of IBAA being backloaded and going the other way. This would equate to about 40 lorry movements per day. Now, at present, the site takes 100,000 tonnes of IBA from within Hampshire and from <coughs> the contract they have in Jersey. The aerial photo here will show the operational area. 
with the MRF to the south and the solar farm to the north. Um, the A303 runs to the south with the slip roads clearly visible into the access and the hall road. Uh, the first photo we have is of the access. Um, this one is taken from the slip road and is actually looking north with the access to the site uh, on the right there. The other one is from the other side, so looking south this time with the access to the site on the left hand side here. <coughs> Excuse me. And the slip road down to the A303 junction here. Now I do have a short video showing the site taken from the landscape bund to the south of the site. So this is looking north. Um, there is a little noise when you listen to this, but th that is actually from the materials recycling facility, which is directly behind me as I've been taking this. That is a panor panoramic view of the video you've just seen taken from the bund to the south of the site looking north. The next photo is again of the plant but taken from within the site by their site offices, so then looking northeast across the actual facility. And the final photo is taken from the western landscape bund looking east to show the uh, plants actually in operation and these are the stockpiles of the IBA waiting to be processed. In terms of the consultations and representations, um, none of the statutory consultees objected to the application. Barton Stacey Parish Council did object on the grounds of general planning creep. Um, Long Parish Parish Council did not object but also did raise the issue of planning creep. Councillor Gibson has been notified, uh, but there were no public representations received about the actual application. So the, the key issues raised um, concern highway safety impacts, the impact on the local community, and the intensification of the development on site. Now, in, in terms of highways, there's a condition on the existing permission limiting HGV numbers. Instead, the movement is controlled by the tonnage limit. The existing permission allows 180,000 tonnes per annum, which equates to about 105 movements per day under their current transport arrangements, whereby the IBA is brought in from the Hampshire sites on Arctic lorries, but then the IBAA is exported to construction projects in eight-wheel tippers. Present, the site is operating at about 60% capacity, which is approximately 100,000 tonnes per annum, equating to about 60 movements per day. Under this proposal, the same lorries importing material from Kent will be backloaded with IBAA for the return journey, and this will equate to about 60 movements. With the 60 movements per day from their current levels of operation, this would result in approximately 101 movements per day, rounding figures up. Now, the highways already were consulted, but they considered that the proposed lorry, lorry numbers are in line with levels already permitted, and so there was no increased impact on the road network, and as such, did not object. In terms of the impact on the local community, there is no change to the operations on site and the EHO were consulted and do not consider that there is any increased impact above that already considered and permitted and consequently did not object either. Now, in terms of intensification, uh, we have to consider each application on its own merits. In this case, it's a temporary increase in throughput for this year and next. There are no other operational or site changes proposed. Now, it is recognised that there have been some relaxation of planning controls, an increase in the high stockpiles and the use of the front field or the wheel operator site, as you probably recognise it, 
um, for the emergency storage of IBAA, but this is only to address emergency changes due to the current pandemic and is not the standard um, working practice. Now, the temporary use of the front field has had another temporary extension until the end of March 21, but the operator has been informed that there will be no further temporary relaxation agreed and that any further extension or changes will need a formal application. Consequently, we have to consider this separate to the current application, which is just for the temporary change to the throughput. We come to the recommendation that Planning Commission be granted subject to the conditions listed in Appendix A. Um, there is a slight change to um, the wording of Condition 14, which uh, James um, has said, I can tell you. Um, we we're just adding two words to the end of the first sentence so that now it will read no more than 180,000 tonnes of incinerator bottom ash waste shall be delivered to the site per year except during 2020 and 2021, when no more than 205,000 tonnes of IDA shall be delivered to the site per year. So we've just added the words per year into that last sentence. Otherwise, it will be um, as included in the, the report. Thank you. Is that better? Yes, we can hear you, Chairman. Thank you. OK, fine. Um, so we now have, so that's the recommendation. Uh, we now have two deputies um, who wish to address the committee. The first one is Councillor Nigel Cooper of Barton Stacey Parish Council. Uh, Mr Cooper, you've got uh, up to 10 minutes, so the floor is now yours. Over to you. Um, yes, thank you. Can you can you actually see me? Yes, we can. You can, because I can't see myself. Okay. Oh, sorry, no, sorry Chairman. Can um, David just um, um, stop screen sharing the presentation just for the broadcast purposes? Thank you. Sorry. Are we okay to go? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for giving Barton Stacey Parish Council the opportunity to present its views about this matter. Um, I'm afraid you're going to hear some more tonnage numbers from me. You've heard a lot of tonnage numbers. I'm going to give you some more because um, it's part of um, really what we're concerned about. But let me say straight away that um, obviously Barton Stacey Parish Council is, is very sympathetic to all businesses that have been hit by the COVID pandemic, whether it's our local pub of Swan or our local shop or indeed, of course, Fortis IBA's activities at the environment, at the Park, just off the A303. I mean, it's, it's unlikely that any resilience planning would have considered the far-reaching consequences of this virus and its impact on all types of business. And obviously, we all hope that um, COVID is not going to be a um, permanent feature of our lives. And we also hope, of course, uh, in this context, that any relaxations of planning conditions and repeated temporary permissions to help organisations such as Fortis and IBA are also genuinely temporary. I mean, to use one example, and it was mentioned just a few minutes ago, temporary permission has been granted to store incinerator bottom ash aggregate outside the buns of the main, main site at the Enviro Park. Enviro Park. Um, and both Barton Stacey and the neighbouring parish of Long Parish would welcome Hampshire County Council's assurance that the ground recently converted for use as emergency storage uh, will be returned to its original condition when that additional storage is no longer required. Um, you know, while we appreciate that that storage of the aggregate should be temporary, um, what seems to be becoming permanent is the gradual but inexorable increase in tonnage of product put through that plant. And that's you, you mentioned the phrase planning creep. We refer to it as operation creep, or the more military-minded um, refer to it as, as mission creep. Um, now, at, at the start of 2017, the permitted tonnage of incinerator bottom ash to be processed was, I think, 120,000 tonnes. Um, in April 2017, permission was granted to increase that by 50% to 180,000 tonnes, one of the figures mentioned. 
And until early this year, the actual throughput though was, was only running at 100,000 tonnes. And that's the stuff um, from Hampshire incinerators plus a little bit from, from Jersey. <laughs> and you heard Fortis want to increase this from 180 to 205,000 tonnes, a modest enough increase, you might think, um, but it would represent more than double the actual annual tonnage uh, that we were seeing at the start of 2020. And, and also, as we heard, um, the reason for this is that Fortis had a deal um, with a new energy from waste plant um, near Sittingbourne, which came on stream earlier this year, but the IBA processing facility that Fortis were going to operate, very close to that new incinerator, has yet to be built. Um, so the IBA is being transported 100 miles to the A303 Enviro Park at the rate of 11,500 tonnes a month, increasing the monthly throughput at the Enviro Park by almost 140%. Now, this operation raises two concerns for Barton Stacey and for Long Parish. The total monthly tonnage of IBA trucked to the A303 site has been around 20,000 tonnes a month from May this year. Uh, that's the total of tonnage, regular tonnage from Hampshire, plus the new stuff coming in from Kent. And Fortis are forecasting that this monthly tonnage will continue until at least uh, July 2021. Now, as we've heard also, a temporary increase to 205,000 tonnes a year is sought for calendar years 2020 and calendar year 2021. But what I want to, I want to make this point, during those two years, there will be at least 15 consecutive months with a throughput of around 20,000 tonnes. And that means that for an extended period, there will be a rolling annual total of around 240,000 tonnes. So not 180, not 205, but a rolling annual total of 240,000 tonnes. The second concern is that the monthly tonnage of 20,000 may continue for considerably longer than is currently being forecast due to further delays in the IBA processing facility near Sittingbourne coming on stream. <clears throat> According to Kent County Council's website, the plan A application for that facility was validated in January 2020. Um, perhaps that was about a month before the energy from waste plant came on stream. Now, logically, one would have thought perhaps that the IBA facility should have come on stream at the same time as the incinerator. That, ha that hasn't happened. And, and as at yesterday, we believe that planning permission, planning application, actually, is still under consideration. So this raises the question of over exactly when the IBA plant near Sittingbourne will actually come on stream, given that planning permission hasn't yet been granted. The conclusion from this is that the IBA will be trucked uh, the 100 miles from Kent um, not only until July next year, but well beyond, possibly throughout the whole of 2021 and possibly even into 2022. So that next year we could see 240,000 tonnes. That's the 20,000 tonnes a month. That's what we're calling operation creep or mission creep. We started with 100,000 tonnes, um, 420,000 tonnes four years ago. Permission was granted for 180. They wanted temporary increase to 205, but we're actually going to see possibly 240,000 tons next year. The numbers just keep going um, up and up. Um, now, clearly, there's cost implications for Fortis uh, for hauling the IBA to Barton Stacey, sending the aggregate back to Kent. And logically, we understand, of course, they'll want to minimise the tonnage and obviously the costs are transported in this way. But ultimately, a business with assets will want to optimise the use of those assets by processing more tonnage. And for the residents of Barton Stacey and Long Parish, um, every extra tonne process means additional transport in and out, possibly larger stockpiles of unprocessed and processed material, potentially more noise and more smell. It means more HGVs leaving and joining the A303 on very short slip roads. Um, and incidentally, um, 
when when we saw the pictures of, of the slip roads, what I don't think we did see, the one which causes one of the main concerns is that all the westbound traffic, which will be the, the stuff coming from Kent, for example, coming off on the narrow slip road to Barton Stacey has to come to a T-junction. And lorries just often come out of there with no regard to any approaching traffic. So we'll see more HGVs leaving and joining the A303 on very short slip roads, more HGVs swinging out of the premises of the Enviro Park across Copen Road to join the eastbound slip road. And as I've just said, queuing, and they do queue at the T-junction to turn right to get across the bridge over the A303. Now, residents comment that they sometimes feel intimidated by these trucks, that they're really big beasts. And car drivers and um, cyclists um, and do feel vulnerable. Now, we know that traffic volumes can be mitigated by the use of backhauls, um, but the delay in the construction um, of the Fortis facility in Kent will have an adverse effect on residents in Barton Stacey and Long Parish due to the increase in, in throughput and vehicle movements that wouldn't otherwise have occurred. And it is, it is, this is, this is a key thing for us, really, the number of vehicle movements that causes concern and nuisance. So perhaps um, that should be capped um, perhaps on a, on a daily basis. So just in summary, the way we see it is that the tonnage is actually increasing by 140%. That is, that is operation creep. And it leaves two questions. Um, how long is temporary? And when will the tonnage increases stop? Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. I'll now throw it open to the members to see if they have any questions of Councillor Cooper. Nigel Cooper. Councillor Philpott. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, it, this is going to be confusing, Councillor Nigel Cooper, because there's too many Councillor Coopers here, I think, today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so if I, I, I if I deal with first name terms, Nigel, hello. Yes, yes um, correct. I've got a question for you regarding the uh, the concerns you've put because they're very detailed concerns, and uh, you've obviously done a great deal of research and uh, as to the tonnages and so on. But my first question to you is: um, at the meeting, uh, the liaison meeting of the 9th of September, was uh, was Barton Stacey Parish Council represented at that meeting? And if it was represented at that meeting, did you put these points to uh, the operator? And if you did put them to the operator, what response did you receive? Um, yes, we. I, I, yes, I was the um, Barton Stacey Parish Council representative at, at that meeting on 9th September. Yes, I, di I did raise this issue, particularly of the, um, the 240,000 tonnes, which we get to by, by totalling up um, 20,000 tonnes a month over a 12 month period, over 12 months periods. And um, well, his, his point was, um, the representative from Fortis was that they had agreed with Hampshire County Council that the tonnages will be calculated on a calendar year basis. So my point about the, the rolling annual average, uh, as far as he was concerned, was it, the arithmetic might be correct but in, as far as the calendar year basis is concerned, they would not exceed the 205,000 tonnes that they were um, seeking permission for. But that was, that was the response. I see. Can I, can I ask another question then, Chairman, uh, following, following on from that? Uh, clearly, clearly, you've come here today, uh, Nigel, with, uh, with the view and concern of the parish council that uh, that there's a danger that uh, that beyond July 2021 these 20,000 per calendar month tonnages will continue, and therefore you're asserting that there's a potential for 240,000 tons per annum as a yeah. result of that. If, yeah. if that's the case, then uh, are you not at all reassured by a the operator's assurances that it's it's measured on a calendar month, a calendar year of 205,000 tonnes, and B, the enforcement of the county council to ensure that it does not go at any stage in a calendar year beyond 205,000, 
which is what we're being asked to consider uh, as a committee today as the absolute maximum uh, restriction. Yeah, well, obviously, I would be reassured by um, the Council's um, enforcement of, of 205,000 tonnes, but just looking at it practically, at this stage, we're in October, mid-October, towards the end of October even, um, permission has yet to be granted for the construction of that IBA facility and in Kent, and they're, they're saying, Fortis are saying, that it could come on stream um, sometime in July next year. How many months away? That, that's nine months. I, I don't know how long it takes to construct a facility, um, but just my, my gut feel is that nine months would be an incredibly short period. Hence, my view, and it's, it's only a view, there's, there's no proof, it's, a, it's an opinion, if you like, um, it's thinking of the practical nature of these things, um, but the, the tonnage from the Kent energy from waste plant will have to be uh, brought over to Barton Stacey for longer than is currently um, forecast. And maybe what, for, what Fortis will have to do is seek a further um, extension or, or, or a further temporary uh, permission to increase the tonnage a bit more if they're in danger of exceeding that 205,000 tonnes on a calendar year basis. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, you're muted, Chairman. And thank you, Councillor Cooper. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, you've just muted again. <clears throat> oh, it looks like the chairman has is just rejoining the meeting. Councillor Quantrill, did you um, have a question? I'll just see if um, Councillor Latham's going to join us again. Um. Thank you. I'm, I'm Vice Chairman Councillor Nigel of the committee. So whilst Councillor Layson's rejoining, uh, I did have a question and it was regarding your points, which were very well put about the rolling average. Um, yeah. But your answer to Councillor Philpott has given me the uh, your viewpoint concerning that. And I, I do share it as well. Um, but I do note that the application um, or the extension will be to the end of December. So we do have that leeway. Um, because I do join you in, in uh, wondering whether everything will go to plan for the Kent side. Um, yeah. But knowing that, we this, this committee has got that foresight with the officer's uh, recommendation um, to extend it further beyond July uh, as well. But we'll come back, if we may, with the officers later on in the meeting, Councillor Nigel, uh, and look at that rolling average um, and against the calendar year as well. And I'll raise that with the officers in due course um, once the uh, um, part of the meeting arrives at that point. So thank you. I don't have anything else, but Katie, if Councillor Latham isn't with us, shall I take over as vice chairman? I think he's managed to rejoin. Are you there, Councillor Latham? Hi, Councillor Latham. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Right, OK. Um, so I think we... Uh, thanks for that. I'm having trouble with my mute and unmute this morning. Um, I think we've dealt with Councillor Cooper uh, and now we've got uh, Rob Westall to address us on behalf of the applicant, who no doubt will address some of the points raised by Councillor Cooper. Then we will bring back... Uh, D David Smith, who can deal with the question of lorry movements and, of course, where the planning application is in Kent at the moment. So I'll pass you over now to Rob Westall um, to address us on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, uh, councillors. Can you hear and see me OK? Yeah. That's good. So my name's Rob Westall and I'm uh, Planning and Estates Director for the Raymond Brown Group. 
which includes our incinerator bottom ash processing division uh, Fortis. I've got a short deputation timed around about five minutes, um, but I'll try and pick up on uh, on some of the issues raised by by Councillor Nigel. Um, I was at, in, in fact, I chaired our, uh, our liaison group meeting on the 9th of September, um, so I can I can hopefully pick up on some of those points. So, um, as you're aware, our uh, incinerator bottom ash for processing facility at the A303 Enviro Park uh, is an integral part of Hampshire's uh, waste infrastructure, receiving waste residues from the county's three incinerators, recovering metals and producing a secondary recycled aggregate for use in construction. We also receive a limited quantity of uh, incinerator bottom ash from the states of Jersey through Southampton Dock. Uh, and as we've been talking about earlier this year, we began to receive incinerator bottom ash from a new energy from waste facility near Sittingbourne in Kent. The flow of ash from the new uh, energy from waste facility in Kent has necessitated the application which is before you today. So just to explain the background uh, to the situation in Kent, we submitted a planning application for our new processing facility very close to the, um, the new Kent energy from waste site back in January this year. Um, our application has been delayed by various COVID related issues during the decision making process, most notably the speed at which uh, stakeholders have provided responses to information submitted and delays with the Environment Agency in particular as they prioritised uh, healthcare related permit applications uh, at the start of lockdown. I'm pleased to report now that our application, planning application in Kent is at a stage where all outstanding issues have been resolved and as long ago as yesterday Kent County Council confirmed that they will be recommending approval and we have a committee date of the 9th of December for a decision. Grant of that planning permission will allow us to uh, start construction of our new facility over in Kent removing the need to transport that ash from Kent to the A303 Enviro Park and the costs and operational issues which go with it. Uh, the new energy from waste facility in Kent was commissioned back in February and we expected, or we were told at the time, that um, the commissioning phase would take a good few months uh, to do as the new plant was tested and verified and checked uh, with the Environment Agency, but by May 2020, the thing was up to full production, much earlier than we'd expected, much earlier. Um, so at the time we submitted the application before you, uh, which was in June, we'd done a forecast um, for projected volumes to the end of this year from all sources, from Hampshire, from Jersey and from, and from the new facility in Kent. And we thought we would be around about just over 200,000 tonnes uh, for the whole of 2020. This set against our current limit of 180,000 tonnes in the calendar year. In the intervening months since our application was submitted, uh, volumes have fluctuated for all manner of different reasons. We've had various um, energy from waste facilities have breakdowns, some have had maintenance, and we've managed to divert a small proportion of the um, ash from Kent into one of our other sites in Buckinghamshire, which had a, a small amount of capacity uh, available to use. So come the end of 2020, our latest prediction is that we will be around about 190,000 tonnes during this calendar year. Um, predictions and forecasts for 2021 are based on assumed average monthly productions from the three sources, from Hampshire, from Jersey and from, from Kent. Um, and again, there will be fluctuations in that as various facilities um, have to close for various different reasons. Um, we anticipate still being in a position to accept incinerator bottom ash at our new pro processing facility in Kent. Uh, in July of 2021, based on a decision, positive decision from Kent County Council at the beginning, beginning of December. Um, and the 205,000 tonnes 
that we predicted during 2021 uh, should be sufficient and we've also built in some headroom in that um, for a couple of months uh, just to to take into account any unpredicted um, delays that we may may face. Um, it's, it's safe to say this is not a position we wish to find ourselves in. Um, we'd, we'd expect it to be ready to receive IBA, our new facility in Kent, uh, this calendar year. Um, we didn't anticipate the time uh, it's taken for a decision, both from Kent County Council and, and the Environment Agency on the planning and permit uh, applications, respectively. Um, it should be noted uh, that the Environment Agency have already granted a variation to our existing permit at the A303 Enviro Park for the increased throughput to 205,000 tonnes. Um, they dealt with this in, in record time, um, acknowledging and recognising the importance of, uh, of the issue to the continued flow, flow of waste across the region. Um, there's been some suggestions of planning creep or mission creep or operational creep, um, call it what you will, as a result of the various uh, dispensations we've been forced to request uh, to uh, during the current pandemic um, to allow us to continue operating. Um, I'd just like to reassure members that, that our, these requests that we've, we've had to make are only those which have been absolutely necessary to continue uh, what we do at the A303 Enviro Park, um, we've had to uh, we've had to use temporarily uh, an area of land that you'll know better for uh, having been subject to a, a previous um, DCO application for for an incinerator with wheelabrator. Um, the material that's out there stored on that field. Um, predominantly arose during the first two months of the initial lockdown period during April and May. Um, the construction industry ground to a halt and we, we, we just couldn't move the material off site. Um, Hampshire County Council have been extremely understanding, the Environment Agency have been extremely understanding in allowing us these temporary dispensations and we, and we don't take that for granted. Um, we will be moving that material off that area of land as quickly as practically possible. Um, so please be assured that we're doing all we can to return to a state of normality. Um, we don't want to be transporting material from Kent to the A303 Enviropar for any longer that's absolutely necessary. It's horrendously costly, not just financially, but environmentally. Um, and we're doing all we can to um, to ensure that we're that we, we we have our necessary consents over in Kent and we're able to build that new facility on time. I do hope you can understand the situation we find ourselves in um, and I'd be very pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you Mr Westall. Am I on YouTube? Yes you are Chairman. Oh good, okay. Um, right. Um, does anyone, do any members have any questions of Mr. Westall? Councillor Quantrill. Um, Mr. Westall, you seem to have been, or your company and your management seem to be remarkably astute at managing a changing situation uh, and working with both Kent and Hampshire um, to best effect. Would you agree? We we try our best. These are. Uh unprecedented times at the beginning of the year we could never have um, foreseen uh, what was going to happen um, and we've had to react we've had to react um, quickly uh, and we've been very reliant on the goodwill of, of, of Hampshire County Council and, and the Environment Agency to, to help see us through this this crisis. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions? Uh, of Mr. Westall. So we've now heard from Councillor Cooper and Rob Westall in response. Uh, do the officers of David Smith wish to say anything further in relation to um, quantities um, and or the planning application in Kent? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, firstly, I would 
um, just point out that the existing condition refers to importation per annum. And so that is taken as a yearly figure. So it's from January to December. If the original permission had intended there to be a monthly limit or a rolling average, it would have worded the condition imposed differently so mm -hmm. that we required so much per month or an average of so much over a 12 month period. Um, it didn't say that, it just purely is 180,000 tonnes per annum. So that is taken from January to December. Um, in terms of Kent, um, as uh, Mr. Westall just mentioned, uh, I had an email from Kent County Council yesterday to confirm that they were intending to take it to their November committee recommended approval. Unfortunately, their officer um, is unable to finish the report. So it will be going to the next committee at the beginning of December with a recommendation for approval. Um, there is the possibility that it could be delegated in the interim, but at the very least it will be going, say, to, uh, to their December committee for approval. Thank you for that. Um, so I think we've dealt with the deputies who, and the question of officers. Deputies obviously play no further part in the decision making. Um, can we now go to into debate uh, as to whether does anyone wish to debate this item? Councillor Philpot and then Councillor Quantrill and then Councillor Gibson. Councillor Philpot is first up. <coughs> Chairman, if I may, I just got a question for David. Is that okay first? Oh, yeah, fine. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question, David, is, uh, is how, um, how, how robust do you consider our, uh, our conditions to be in terms of enforcing this 205,000 tonne or current 180,000 tonne limit per, per annum? And what uh, what sanctions are there if uh, if the uh, operator were to exceed it? That's my question, Chairman. And if uh, I'm happy to uh, defer to other members if they have questions, and then perhaps come back at a later time for the debate. Thank you. Um, well, in terms of the enforcement of the condition, um, obviously they are required under different legislation to keep Weybridge figures of all the material that is imported and goes through their plant. We have access to all of those figures. So we would, it's a, a simple process to find out how much they have imported each month and then over the year. In terms of actual enforcement, um, the most simple step would be what we can call a breach or condition notice. If they have imported too much, then we could serve a notice on them, in which case they would then go to the magistrate's court to, as a simple case, have you imported too much or not. Um, it wouldn't be a matter of needing appeals or planning inspectors. It would be straight to uh, a magistrate's court. Oh, Councillor Latham, okay. would you mind if I just come in on the end of um, on, on what Dave's just said? I'd just like to give members some, you know, further reassurance. You know, Dave and his team actively monitor. Mm -hmm all our existing minerals and waste sites um, and um, actively go up and, and monitor this site. And so we would be, uh, as normal, um, making sure that this site is in compliance with its conditions. Um, so I just wanted to give that extra level of assurance in terms of enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Councillor Quantrill, Councillor Gibson, did you have questions of David Smith or, or do you want to go into debate? Uh, I had a question, Chairman, which if I uh, might pose it. Yeah. Um, and and um, Mr. Smith may um, advise me that it's not part of this application. Um, Councillor Nigel um, mentioned that there was a, a, the emergency storage area um, and would like confirmation of the restoration of that. Is that within this application for us to consider or observe? No, it isn't. No. Right. I withdraw the question then. Thank you. Councillor Gibson, do you want to debate or question? Um, I, I actually thought I was going to get a, a small section to to make some comments, but um, um, well, just like to make it's the best time. Probably now is the best time then. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, look, I just like to say um, I feel a little bit vilified for having brought this to committee, but both Long Parish and uh, Barton Stacey. Um, are quite sensitive um, to this particular site. 
obviously um, the incinerator has increased people's awareness and also the um, the, the knowledge. I mean, uh, Councillor Nigel Cooper is massively knowledgeable and all his figures are accurate because um, there's been a lot going on on the site. I'd like to make the point that the liaison committee works really well. Both David Smith and uh, Lisa Kirby Hawks are, are brilliant. They give massive support. And um, I've been on the um, liaison committee for many years and it's always been um, a good committee, well attended, regular, um, regularly um, uh, taking place. Um, and um, I have no negative comments about um, uh, the Raymond Brown grouping on the site. Um, but um, the reason that I was keen when it came to committee was simply that, um, and it's not that I'm against this particular um, application, it's that um, over the last few months since COVID, we've had um, an increase work in working hours. We've had um, permission for temporary use of the wheel of greater um, ground, which um, which I, uh, um, is going to be reinstated um, for storage. We've had an increase in the height of the storage because obviously um, COVID's gone on longer and, and longer. And now we've got these movements. Um, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is that um, clearly um, the truck movements are going to be um, max, uh, limited in the sense that if you come all the way from Kent, you're not going to go back empty. So um, um, some, of the, um, some of the movements will be mitigated by the fact that the trucks coming will also be fully loaded going back. So um, um, they'll be used more than most other truck, truck movements. But um, the issue is that with all of these temporary um, permissions, the villagers are really concerned, not with any individual one, but with the general creep that um, um, will the increased hours um, go back to where, where they were before COVID? Um, will the wheel operator site get put back to its previous uh, state? Will the mounds um, start coming down? And the villagers are just concerned that we will lose track because of the number of um, uh, different um, uh, applications and temporary um, permissions that, that we will end up not being able to control it and suddenly it'll all, all of those permissions will become de facto. And, and I'm just voicing that concern. Now, having said that, I believe that David and Lisa are well in control of the, uh, the situation, but I did want it on record that there is a concern and that all of these temporary permissions need to be monitored. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. Andrew. That's Thank very clear. Right, we then go to, do any members wish to debate this item? Uh, I have a question, Chairman. Mark All right. Cooper. Uh, sorry, Mark, yes. Um, Chairman, yes, the question relates to the conditions uh, and not to anything else. I, I'm, I'm very sanguine about the debate itself. Um, condition 11 on page 26 uh, relates to the dust uh, and odour uh, situation. Um, seeing the photographs on uh, David's presentation of the A303 site, I was struck by the size of the ash piles. Um, I know the ash is fairly gritty stuff, so the dust isn't a big issue, but I note that the, the dust condition relates to a control scheme version 6 from April 2014, when of course the actual volumes involved were much smaller, and we didn't have any extensions uh, into storage into the area alongside. Is that current condition uh, enough to cover the increases uh, in site storage of I I IBA and IBAA uh, and into the extension area? In other words, uh, is there some security from that dust condition? David? Just unmute. Um, uh, thank you, Councillor Cooper. Um, it, it does in the sense that it, it is um, a sort of open-ended condition, so it, it is there to cover any eventuality of dust from site, irrespective of the height of the stockpiles. 
But um, when we gave the temporary relapsation of the condition, one of the provisos was that they do not cause any other or any extra environmental or amenity concerns. If they did, then we would um, withdraw the actual temporary relaxation. So in terms of the condition, yes, I do think it is robust enough to deal with any particular issues. But even if it didn't, we would then have the ground to actually um, withdraw the temporary relaxation that uh, we've currently granted them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Do members wish to go into debate now on this item? Sorry, Chairman, Councillor Hughes has his hand raised. I wasn't, I'm wasn't. i not sure whether that's a question or for debate. Councillor Hughes. Um, good morning. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's actually the, the debate, if I may be the first one to speak. Um, I have to say what a reassuring discussion we've had for the past uh, 40 minutes um, to hear um, deputies uh, outline concerns, to hear those mm -hmm. concerns addressed by uh, the company, to Councillor Gibson raise the concerns of his residents. And for the first time in my life, I have to say that the old adage I've used, which is there's nothing more permanent than temporary, is actually wrong. I actually believe this is a temporary extension. Um, and I believe that, the, from what I've heard, the company is sincere. Um, <coughs> what we've been told by David Smith in relation to the checks and balances in terms of the weights going through uh, the um, processing plant would appear to be auditable and enforceable. And, um, and I'm very much of the opinion that COVID has brought many things to us. And one of the things it has brought is pragmatism. And I believe this is a pragmatic discussion, a pragmatic decision, and we should accept it in true faith that by uh, the end of 2021, it will be back to its normal volumes and hopefully the process in planning in care will be up and running. So I would like to support the recommendation as on the paper. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. I think Councillor Philpott's now put his hand up again. Yeah. Yes, sorry, Chairman. I just wanted to say a couple yeah. of things. So I, I want to reassure Councillor Gibson that uh, no, there's going to be no criticism, certainly from me and I'm sure from colleagues. In fact, I'd like to thank him and congratulate him for bringing this to our attention. I think it's an extremely important matter and uh, not only for, for his residents, but for us to get an understanding of how these things work. Um, I, w I listened very carefully to Councillor Nigel Cooper and I thought he made a very, uh, a very astute and very well uh, constructed presentation. And I certainly understand, and, I can, and we can well understand, that, the, that there would be fears, I'm sure, and concerns from residents that he represents on the parish council and that Councillor Gibson represents in his county division, that there may be some form of creep and, uh, and so on in this matter. However, I would say that uh, the increase in tonnages, if it were to, to exceed 205,000, we've heard from uh, Mr Smith, will be uh, very uh, uh, strictly uh, regulated and uh, and so I'm completely satisfied with the answer on that. I'm also aware and I'm, we will all be aware that if the uh, company want to exceed the 205,000 they will have to come back to this committee for a further request to do so and uh, and whilst one wouldn't want to preempt that one wonders whether there would be the same level of sympathy for the uh, for that company coming back for that kind of uh, uh, increase but that's a matter for the committee perhaps in future. Um, what happens in Kent, uh, Chairman, is out with our control. Uh, we, I think it's uh, to some extent, it's uh, in a, our debate today is a red herring. I understand they have a planning committee on the 9th of December, that's up to their planning committee at Hampshire Kent County Council to determine. <laughs> One thing I would say, the last thing I would say, Chairman, is an observation. And I was very interested to hear Mr Smith's uh, explanation to us as to what would happen in terms of consequences should the company uh, fail to meet their obligations in terms of the tonnages and it goes straight to magistrates uh, for, for a consideration. We spend an awful lot of time, Chairman, uh, these meetings uh, discussing the numbers of vehicle movements uh, in and out of particular sites per week or month or whatever. And, uh, and we often have residents and councillors representing those residents complaining bitterly that, uh, that, that these companies exceed that and what on earth are we going to do about it and so on. Now, I realise that that's not going to be the case in every case because uh, vehicle movements sometimes are going to be the only way to regulate it. But 
I would I would much rather see if there's a possibility, uh, just if coming out, if anything good comes out of this debate today, that we could review in certain cases where appropriate the issue of tonnages over a period of time or or, uh, or, or something of that sort, rather than the number of vehicle movements, because that would actually, uh, I would think, satisfy and curtail an awful lot of other debates that we have. Uh, in this committee in terms of uh, the yard boo that we have from from different organizations. So if that was at all possible, uh, that would be very, uh, very useful to know in due course, Chairman. But in the meantime, I'm very happy to support the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Philpott. Um, do we have, do the officers wish to add anything or does Council, uh, does James Hammond legal advise? Oh, K K Lisa, do you want to add anything? You wouldn't mind, Chairman. Thank you. Um, yeah. I've, I've obviously been listening um, into the concerns particularly raised by the Parish Council um, and Councillor Gibson in particular about the area that we have relaxed um, um, you know, potential use of because of COVID. And it's just, just to give the committee reassurance that um, Dave and his team and, and myself and Chris are, are very much um, aware of the concerns um, about uh, the use of that site and to ensure the successful restoration of that site once the use is, uh, has ended. Um, and that will be taking place. Dave's already said that we've extended it till the end of the financial year for all intents and purposes. Um, and there are various um, conditions to that relaxation. And we will ensure as officers that that site is restored to back to its previous um, use and, um, and condition once that period has ended. As, as Dave has already indicated, if that period needs to be extended, the operator would have to come back to us with a planning application. So that's, a, that's something for another day. But we certainly um, have all of that in our minds and are making sure that that site is worked and st the storage is taking place to ensure amenity impacts are at the lowest. And just, just finally, um, just one further point is, you know, I've also uh, looked on with interest about the discussion about enforcement. And just to make members aware that we are going to be reviewing the enforcement plan um, for the service um, and that will be coming to committee by way of an update once that has been completed for you to discuss so just some of the issues that came up um, today will be pertinent to that review so thank you thanks Lisa uh, James uh, from a legal point of view I know you've pointed out there are two extra words which have to go into one of the conditions is there anything else you wish to add to this application uh, no, nothing from me, Chairman, um, other than perhaps this uh, might be a good opportunity to uh, remind the committee that where uh, conditions are attached to a uh, planning permission, proposed to be attached to a planning permission, the committee is obliged to consider that they will be complied with and that enforcement will be effective. Um, other than that general point, happy for uh, votes to proceed. Right, so we can then go to the recommendation contained on page eight. That planning commission be granted subject to conditions listed in appendix a with the addition of two extra words um katie do you want to go through the um voting procedure and take us through it thank you chairman what the result's going to be yes thank you I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick roll call vote just yeah. for, for transparency so um i'll go through alphabetically with members um, and if you could just confirm whether you are for, against, or wish to abstain from the recommendation. Uh, Councillor Carter? For. Thank you. Councillor Mark Cooper? For. Thank you. Councillor Rod Cooper? For. Councillor Frankham? For. Councillor Gibson? Um, I, I'll abstain because of my conflict. Okay. Councillor Hare? For. Councillor House? For. Councillor Hughes? For. Councillor Irish? For. Councillor Latham? For. Councillor McAvoy? For. Councillor Penman? For. Councillor Philpot? For. Councillor Price? For. Councillor Quantrill? For. And Councillor Warwick? For. Thank you. So those recommendations, that recommendation is carried with 15 in favour and one abstention. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, at our training session, uh, comfort breaks were mentioned. Uh, we've been going for an hour now. Does anyone, would anyone like a five minute comfort break before we go into item number seven?
would appear not. So we then go into item number seven. Uh, and so this one is in due course going to be presented by Philip Millard. It is an application for variation of condition one of the planning permission to extend the time period of extraction to 31st of December 2022 and complete restoration within a further period of two years at the Frith End Sand Quarry. Uh, members will have read the report and will be aware of the flood which took place in February of this year, which effectively brought all excavation of sand and gravel from the site to an end. And uh, in effect, nothing has been done since then. And the application is therefore to extend the time limit to extract, I think, the extra 1,500 tonnes of sand and gravel from the site and for restoration to be completed. That basically is the application and I'll ask Philip now to expand on with full details of it. Hello. Thank you Chairman and, and good morning committee. Um, I'm just going to set up my presentation. I won't be a second. Okay, hopefully everyone can see uh, the presentation up on their screens now. Okay, um, so item seven, as uh, the chairman has um, introduced, uh, is variation condition one, the time scale uh, for the extraction of sand and um, sharp, well, soft sand and uh, silica sand at uh, Grundon's Frith End Sand Quarry uh, in Frith End near Borden in uh, northeast Hampshire. Uh, they are seeking to extend the time period for the extraction from the 31st of December 2020 to uh, the 31st of December 2022 uh, with completion of the restoration for the two years after that. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the site is located on uh, just off the A325 with a dedicated hall road uh, just north of Borden in the northeast of Hampshire. Uh, the site is shown here on this plan. Uh, this is the A325 uh, running north and um, north south, and the dedicated hall road runs past Groomsfarm and into the existing site. Um, I've got a number of photographs as we haven't had now the opportunity to have a uh, committee site visit due to the, the COVID uh, issues at the moment. Uh, on this plan, uh, you'll note the perimeter of the site and the location of the River Slay to the south of the site, um, the breach and the flooding issue that the chairman uh, mentioned in his introduction is in this area. I'll show you again on a number of uh, images in the future. Um, the site uh, arrangement, for those that may not be quite so familiar, as you come through the hall road, uh, they have their site offices and um, facilities in this top corner. Uh, there is a footpath that runs through the site uh, east to west a public footpath has remained open. There has been some challenges uh, in the past few years with um, subsistence of the ground. Um, they are, are now uh, in operation and the footpath is, is open to the public. Um, the main working area to the centre and there's also uh, restoration that's occurring at the same time. Uh, you tend to find restoration running from east to west through the site. Um, of significant note in the uh, approved um, processes on the site is how the restoration occurs. So due to the levels and the proximity to the river, uh, the worked area for extraction is only to be restored with natural clay materials, not inert waste, as is more typical on other quarry sites. Uh, they are acquiring this um, virgin clay material from the north of the footpath, the north of the site, and that's extracted from there to restore this area. And then inert material is brought in to restore this area here. Also of note on this is the location of uh, local residencies. Um, you'll note the grey line shows the 100 metre 
boundary, which uh, we typically um, send out consultation um, to local residents. It's been extended to some extent in order to capture these closer uh, properties here. There are also properties down near Trotsford Farm, about 400, 500 metres to the southwest of the site, and then also Holt Farm, and uh, residents up here to the north, again, about 500 metres from the site. These weren't directly consulted, but they have been engaged through the liaison panel and the members of that panel. Uh, this is an aerial photo that was provided by the applicant and the operator, which hopefully gives a good breakdown of the current situation of the site. Uh, as I mentioned before, in this area here is the breach of the river today, and uh, the blue line donate, delineates the area which has been impacted by the flooding and is currently full of water. Um, the access hall rose is up in the top left corner again. And as I mentioned, the area that they're extracting material from in order to restore the, the quarried area to the south. Um, the members will be familiar in the report. Uh, there's reference to some activities that are managing to continue to an extent on the site. Uh, this yellow area here shows a small area of extraction material that can be extracted at the time of the application. Um, so three, four months ago. Uh, the application stated that this was approximately 20,000 tonnes worth of material. Um, the remaining material in the site is around about 100 to 120,000 tonnes remaining. I'm sure the applicant will be able to clarify the exact number uh, when they speak later if, if it's required. Um, to mention the area to the east has been recently restored with uh, silt ponds removed and then this area here is the current area under restoration. Uh, restoration is ongoing to the north area as well. However, this has also been impacted by the COVID situation at the moment in the sense that uh, imported uh, waste material, inert material to restore that is currently limited. And so that has slowed down that progress as well. Um, so the operators are on a, a very minimal uh, ability to operate the site at the moment with as good as no, no extraction and minimal restoration. Um, they're doing what, what current situations allow them to do. Uh, moving on to some photographs. Um, in the bottom right, you'll see uh, uh, an aerial photograph image, which will show you the location and direction the photograph's taken in. Um, this is a picture of the extract area uh, back uh, last year before any flood event. Um, you'll note uh, that you can see the sand faces that extraction is occurring from. Um, the river slay is over to this side to the right of the picture, and we're looking southeast from here. Uh, this is a photograph in almost the same area uh, in February 2020 uh, when the flood occurred on the river breach. You'll know at the top of the picture here, this is the, the breaching area where the, the force of the river cut through uh, the, the field uh, and broke through the the edge of the quarry area, filling the area with water. Uh, we then go on to another photograph, which is closer to that breaching area, um, and you'll uh, be able to observe the, the extent of the flooding. Uh, in the distance, just here where you can see some puzzle sand, that's the small area of extraction that I mentioned before in yellow on the, the previous uh, aerial photograph plan of the site. Uh, the uh, Horizon here is where the location of the footpath that runs through the centre of the site from east to west is. Moving on to another photograph, this time looking northeast, you'll see again the extent of the flooded area. Uh, this time, this photograph was taken in September, really demonstrating the consistent level of, of the water currently on site. Um, for reference, this area here is known as uh, Ranks Hill, which is on the edge of the site to the west. Uh, this is the processing uh, the area platform uh, where the uh, operator stores and uh, processes and exports sand and gravels from uh, with their access track in this diagonal line up here. Again, the footpath runs along this ridge line, the Hall Road being uh, located sort of just around these trees in this area here. Um, I do have a video. Um, David Smith with item six was very successful in managing to get his to run. I've tested this one. It doesn't work very well in PowerPoint. So 
uh, I will show the video at the end after the recommendation slide. Um, it has a panoramic view of the site, so hopefully it gives a bit of a better context of how the site fits together. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the proposal for the site is for the restoration of condition one to the current planning permission on the site, uh, which is 30633034. Um, and this seeks to extend the lifespan of the site from uh, its current extraction limitation at the end of this year, 2020, to the 31st of December, 2022. And uh, that would also mean that the restoration would occur two years later, we're seeking the restoration to be completed by December 2024. Um, the reason cited by the applicant is for the uh, given required extension of time is the need to address the impacts caused by the significant flood event uh, at the site in February, as shown in the photographs just shown. Um, it is estimated there's about 12 to 18 months of sand resources remaining in the quarry at the time, at this time. Um, the Environment Agency have stated that an emergency works permit is required to carry out those works. Um, as members will be aware, if they have the opportunity to read the update report, um, the applicant has uh, notified uh, ourselves and also the liaison panel that that permit has now been received um, and that will allow, allow them to be able to uh, start commencing work. Um, the uh, information that has provided within the application and the update report emphasises the um, required timescales and the weather um, needs that that work requires. So the process will require the applicants to drain the water from the uh, existing site to remove the, the flood water back into the river, which is part of the reason why the Environment Agency required that work permit because we weren't permitted to do so without it. Uh, once that's done, they'll need to allow it to dry for a number of weeks until they can manage to access it with uh, plant machinery uh, in order to start doing the repairs. So um, it does have some length to the process of doing that uh, to then allow them to start commencing their approved development of extracting the sand and commencing and completing the restoration of the site. Uh, consultation perspective, uh, none of the statutory authorities had objection to the proposed application. Uh, the Environment Agency uh, had no objection subject to existing conditions being retained and they did confirm reviewing the flood risk activity permit was uh, there at the time they were in communication with the applicant. Um, the uh, County Ecology, um, please note they now have no objection. Uh, their uh, response was received last week and uh, is mentioned in the update report. Um, they did just raised that um, due to protected species on the site, mainly great crested newts, that the, um, the, app, the operator should ensure with Natural England that they have the correct uh, permissions and permits in order to, to deal with those. And they will need to be updated if there's a time change to when that work's going to occur. Um, that's outside the remit of planning, um, but it was a, a good point well made by, by Ecology. Uh, Councillor Kent G has objected to him due to concern for operational creep at the site uh, in both time and, and site area. Um, I should point out that this application seeks for an extension of time. There isn't any change to the extraction areas or to the approved restoration scheme. It's, uh, it's seeking for uh, just a 24 month extension of time. Uh, and Kingsley Parish Council has also objected uh, with a suggestion for 12 month extension rather than 24. We've had nine public representations uh, that we've received for the application. Four were in support, um, mainly based upon uh, employment and the supply, steady and adequate supply of sands and gravels in, in the county, and we had five objections. Uh, the predominant issues raised by the objections was a concern for operational creep, which is echoes uh, Council Kent G's concerns, uh, and also uh, the cumulative impact concerns about implications, particularly with noise and dust from sand and, and generally living in proximity to a quarry uh, concerns raised by, by local residents. Uh, the issues of the site is really a uh, decision uh, based on the balance of, of impacts and benefits uh, to the application. As I mentioned before, cumulative impacts of a further two years of the period operations on local residents is a uh, 
potential adverse impact. Um, there is no proposal to intensify or increase operations, and so therefore it's logical to assume that the impacts wouldn't grow in um, capacity or in volume. However, they are stretching out a long time period. Um, the report goes into detail about the history of the site. Uh, the site has been acquired for about 30 years. The um, current permission and approved process and method of operation was approved in 2007. Um, and there has been an extension of time from the original proposed 10 year uh, extraction and restoration period in 2017, uh, where the site was given permission to uh, extend for a, a, another three years in order to extract sand and, and achieve restoration. Um, and this, due to special circumstances mm -hmm. of this flood event, is now looking for a further two years. Uh, and the benefits um, soft and silica sands uh, that the site has are rare. They are uh, in Hampshire, we only have two sites that the um, materials are extracted from, which is this site here in Frith End and also in Kingsley, which is uh, just a few miles away from Frith End. Uh, their locations are quite limited. Um, this is the only area in Hampshire where soft and silica sands are available. Um, councillors may also be aware that we're in quite, quite close proximity to South Downs National Park as well, um, which does have areas of resources for soft and silica sands, um, but there is a general national policy to protect national parks and minimise potential for um, the impacts of, of, of quarrying within them. And so that that kind of pushes the burden a little bit more onto neighbouring uh, areas and regions in order to look to provide that, that national supply of soft and silica sands. Um, not being able to extract their remaining material at the end will effectively result in a sterilisation and that would have uh, potentially significant impacts on, on Hampshire's land bank for these materials, uh, which would be a, a challenge for the, the plan going forwards. Um, also, the other benefit would be the successful restoration of the site uh, back to agriculture and ecological habitat. Um, if, obviously, you've seen photographs of the site's current condition. Uh, it would be very challenging to uh, achieve a, a good quality restoration with the site in its current condition without the ability to resolve the issues and the impacts of the flood and allow the approved restoration scheme to be implemented uh, in, a, in a timely manner. Therefore, uh, the officer recommendation is to um, for planning permission to be granted subject to the conditions listed in Appendix A. Uh, that resolves my, my presentation. Um, I will now just uh, close the presentation and show you that quick panoramic video. If you could just bear with me for a second. Okay, hopefully everyone can now see a picture of a nice tree next to um, the flood area. Um, I'll press play in a second and we'll, we'll pan around from right to left. Uh, we're currently looking in the south area on top of Ranks Hill, if you can uh, recall on, on the aerial plan that's over to the west side <coughs> of the site. Um, in the middle distance you'll see the uh, extent of the area that the river cut through the field. The river's actually back here in the line of the trees um, and the flood area here. So. The panoramic view just pans around to show you the main extent of the extraction area underwater. Uh, and then you've got the, the footpath of the tree line down the centre line. And then we come back round to the, the entrance area of the site. Uh, quick but hopefully informative to, to the committee. Um, thank you very much. I'll now hand back to the chairman. Thank you, Philip. We can now go, then go to the three deputies. Uh, the first one is, I believe, a local resident, Brian Davey. Mr Davey, you've got up to 10 minutes to address the committee. Over to you. Hi, Chairman. Oh, hello. Are you there, Brian? I am indeed. Ah, fantastic. Struggling with all of this technology. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, can you see me if I press any of these buttons? No. Can't see you at the moment. Well, what if I press that one? Can you see me now? Yes, we can see you now. 
misfortune for you all. Right. Um, well, I can't see myself on the screen um, here. Right. Um, I've listened to the officer's presentation. You realise that I meet him fairly regularly when the liaison panel. And I don't think that the extraction of sand is too much of an issue. However, I have some prepared some notes and I shall terribly, I shall read from them. I've done the usual formality. Chairman, councillors, my name is Brian Dagan, but I think we've established that. But I speak as a local resident. I attend the quarterly meetings of the Frith End Sandpit Liaison Panel, and I've been party to the discussions on the future of the sandpit for some months, because it's the future of the sandpit which is the concern. The sand, it's accepted that Hampshire, as Minerals Planning Authority, have a responsibility to ensure the sand is recovered. No debate about that at all. The developer, well, if under the circumstances, technically, two years is the best we can possibly hope for, that has to be. I'm moving from this anyway, unfortunately. Right, in planning history, a frith end sandpit is set out in paragraph 23 of your officer's report. The first consent was granted in 1990, that's 30 years ago, and the quarry was scheduled to close in 2015, and that did not happen. I would probably repeat, there is nothing so permanent as the temporary. Um, since 1990, there have been a constant stream of planning revisions, each superseding the other, and all of them extending the life of the quarry. And this is provoked, which I think everybody recognises. I say it's provoked public discontent, tightening it down, and a feeling of deception caused by broken promises, manipulation, and a disregard of the cumulative impact on the local community. It is a fairly small community, but it is entitled to the peaceful enjoyment of its own homes and property. At the beginning of February this year, there was public relief that mineral extraction would cease on the 31st of December, eight weeks away, Christmas, and at that point, the whole um, mineral extraction process should have ceased. Um, uh, and the restoration would commence, and it would then, the pit would obviously change its status. The quarry would no longer be a protective mineral, active, an active mineral site. It would become an exhausted former mineral extraction site undergoing restoration and no further expansion of the quarry would be permitted. Now, that meant that the long forecast, which I'm supposed not to talk about, um, future planning applications, um, may not, which may not be dis um, discussed by you, I understand that, um, that would change the status and ability of the applicant to actually submit planning applications. Um, the circumstances changed when the pit flooded in February this year. The Minerals Planning Authority, HCC and the operator, had to take steps to avoid the sterilisation of 10 months, only 10 months, February to December, 10 months of sand. At that time, that was what was permitted. Um, uh, and an application to extend the life of the quarry, it seemed appropriate once the thing had flooded. And there can be no debate that that is a sensible thing to do. And a two year time frame in which to recover 10 months worth of sand, it may seem excessive, but under the circumstances, the cumulative impact on the local community was deemed to be acceptable. There wasn't much of a debate about it. You accept facts as they are and be pragmatic. However, a two-year extension of a current planning consent allows the pit operator to submit planning applications for further extensions to the mineral extraction area 
after the existing closure date of the 31st of December this year, eight weeks time, Christmas time. In effect, the application in front of you has become an enabling development scheme to ease the passage of SCR oblique 2020 oblique 0309 and subsequently other areas discussed in the liaison panel meetings. There are plans which the liaison panel knows about, which you don't know about and are unable to know about, identified, and in fact, we've moved off the base. If members would look at their papers, you will find reference to planning application SCR 2020039 on page 37, and it's the first item under the paragraph 23, planning history. It exists, but you're not, not allowed to even debate it. Your planning officer's report will tell you that a scoping application may not be discussed by members or should not influence your decision in any way. But we, local residents and members of this liaison panel, know about it. It's fully minuted, whacking great pages of minutes about it, but you can't take that into consideration. Um, I am free to bring it to your attention. The minutes of the liaison panel are in the public domain and could be made available to you. You may see from your papers that the scoping application was submitted to the HCC on the 22nd of July this year. Now, it's an interesting thing um, because that was very soon after the implications of the flooding event and opportunities became apparent to the operator. A planning application to secure a future life for the pit in front is in front of you, but the quarry remains connected to the river and winter is approaching. Very high likelihood of additional um, flooding this winter. And the reality is that, and I will ad lib this because I'm no expert, but there was quite a distinct separation between damming the point at which the river had entered the quarry and actually dealing with the environment agency truly have uh, responsibility, and I am living all of this, for the restoration of the riverbank and eight metres from it. Beyond that point, the environment agency, as I understand it, have no authority at all. So I am a little critical of the developer. I do believe that that could have been dammed and the pumping operation started, but I digress. Um, um, but there is an opportunity now when the, I better get on with what I've written, uh, a planning application to secure the future life of the pit is in front of you, but the quarry remains connected to the river and winter is approaching. To labour my point, if this current planning application for extension of time is granted, the operator is free to submit a full planning application for sand extraction in two further areas and expand the lifetime of the quarry from beyond the existing 30 years, which is for the families who are local to this thing, an extraordinary length of time. It's difficult to escape the conclusion that the operator has been opportunistic and instead of dealing immediately with the flooding event, has turned misfortune to his advantage. A local community has been disadvantaged yet again and must learn to continue to live with its unwelcome neighbour. I do not think that HCC intends this application to be an enabling development, but it may become one simply by default. Thank you. We have one um, minute left, Brian. One minute, yes, I can cover that easily. I have a positive suggestion. I would ask members to consider agreeing the current proposal for the amendment of condition one, but I would request that members ask their planning officer 
to insert a further condition that no further planning applications for this site will be considered. That establishes the status quo. I suggest this condition of this nature is a common planning practice and that it would be fair, reasonable solution to agree on behalf of the affected local community. Anything else would appear to be oppressive. The result would be that HCC as a mineral planning authority would have prevented the sterilization of a controlled material mineral. The pit operator would have adequate time to recover the mineral sterilized by the flooding event and would retain planning application rights that currently exist, but no more. And the local community would have to live with their unwelcome neighbor for an additional two years but they would have absolute reassurance that the quarry had an end date, which they have long sought, but a date that could be relied on. Please give my proposal serious <laughs> consideration. It could be that everybody wins. Thank you very much, councillors, for listening to me. Thank you, Mr Davey. Um, members, do you have any questions of Mr Davey? Please. Uh, Councillor Philpott. Councillor Philpott. Sorry, Chairman, I'm just uh, having the same problem with my mute button that uh, I think you were earlier on. I Never mind. Resolve that now. No problem. Yes, Mr. David, I'm, I'm going to ask because uh, I, 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 we had a, a, a debate earlier on a completely separate matter, and I asked an applicant, uh, the sorry, I asked the uh, deputy this, this question. I'm going to ask you the same question. You are, uh, I guess, uh, is am I, am I guessing that the residents are involved in the liaison uh, panel? Uh, yes. And uh, if you are involved in the liaison panel, when you've put your concerns to the uh, operator. Uh, re especially regarding your fears of additional and further planning applications, what has been the response from the operator when you've put that to them at the panel? Right, I can, I've got here the last minutes, but the reality is it's been discussed. Um, Mr Millard knows it's well been discussed, pages of the damn stuff here. Um, they're going ahead with it. Um, uh, they're going to go ahead, as you can see, with the scoping report, which I've already brought to your attention. Sorry, Sorry can you I answer have... my question? Thank you. Does it? Thank you. Do you want to take it any further, Canister Philpott? Uh, not at this stage, Chairman. No, no. thank you. Um, right. So, anyone else have any questions of Mr. Davy? Don't think we do. So, we move on to Stuart Mitchell, who is uh, speaking to us on behalf of the applicant. Mr. Mitchell. Uh, good morning. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you for inviting me along. I'm Stuart Mitchell. I'm the yeah. estates manager for Grundon. Uh, responsible for planning and land issues. As we've heard, um, the site was flooded in um, flooded in February. Uh, the UK was hit by Storm Dennis a week earlier. We had Storm um, Storm um, Storm um, um, Kiara. Uh, it resulted in many rivers reaching their highest levels and flooding. Unfortunately, the River Slee um, flooded into the actual quarry. Um, no works can restart at the quarry until the river bank is repaired and the flood water uh, removed. We informed the EA of the flood and the damage and met them on site. Um, they advised that a permit was needed. Um, that any contractor needs to be EA approved. Um, we decided then to appoint a company, uh, Land, and, Land and Water, who were a canal and river works expert. Uh, they work, uh, they do much of their work is for the actual EA. Uh, the role of Land and Water encompasses including getting the actual permit to do the works. Uh, the EA 
undertake a pre-application permit advice system, much in the same way as the planning system does. Um, Land and Water decided to follow this route with the EA, and um, we're happy to say that the permit has indeed been granted. Um, by following the planning pre-app route, uh, the permit was granted in three months rather than the usual six months. The permit has several conditions attached to it. Um, those of relevance are that we can only undertake the repair works and the removal of the flood water when the river level is low. And also that uh, due to fish spawning, uh, we can't do either of those operations between mid-March and mid-June. Mid, uh, mid, um, Land and water uh, were out at the site on Friday. Um, their view was that the river level does not meet the permit conditions uh, as it's about a metre above the permit level. Uh, their concern was that the condition is unlikely to be met until early next year as normal overwinter rainfall will just keep topping the actual river up. Um, we are both going to keep this situation reviewed. Um, Philip briefly outlined um, that the repair bank works would take about uh, four weeks. Pumping out the water would take three to four weeks. And then we need to allow a few weeks for the ground to dry out before machinery can operate. Um, the repair works are relatively straightforward. Uh, it's a clay barrier overlaid with stone. Um, Unfortunately, it, this all has to be done under actually under actually under the actual water, um, which is the reason why uh, the EA have put those constraints into the actual permit. The amount of water to be pumped out from the flooded quarry is quite large. We estimated it 150 million litres. Uh, a large pump will move 400,000 litres per hour. Putting such a large volume into the river requires careful timing. Again, another reason why the EA have put conditions and limits on when that pumping can be done in terms of river levels and fish and fish um, fish um, spawning season. Um, again, if um, there are rainfall events, these are just going to top up the river and we would have to suspend working if they were carrying on. Um, the committee report highlights there are 12 to 18 months of sand remaining um, and restoration needs to be placed into the flooded area. Um, we agree with those estimates. Uh, various representations have been made concerning the actual development. Um, the delay in applying for the permit, as I said earlier, we have went through the pre-app procedure, which halved the determination time and made no difference to the overall time that the permit would normally take. There is no change to amenity impact, only duration. Hampshire officers, as we've heard, monitor the sites, all mineral and waste sites uh, regularly and pretty well. Uh, the committee report at paragraph 85 details that there have been three complaints about the quarry since 2012. Note that the site complies with its planning permission. Um, there are concerns about quarry permits. Um, quarry permission doesn't allow for this, and we're not seeking this with this application or any other application. Following consultation uh, with the Hampshire planning team, it was agreed that a two-year extension was considered reasonable. This is due to uncertainties over when the repair can actually be made, the fish spawning period, and the remaining work and restoration required at the site. 
It's been suggested that a shorter one-year period could be given. Unfortunately, this doesn't really recognise the permit restrictions that we have. It would result in the repair works being completed within that period, but the working and restoration would only be partially complete. It would inevitably result in a further application in 12 months' time. The working and restoration can only be completed properly in accordance with the planning permission if the river bank is repaired. Sufficient time needs to be allowed to comply with the EA permit conditions. Secondly, to undertake the repair and to remove the flooded area. And thirdly, mm -hmm. to carry out the quarry working and restoration. We've requested an extension of time that reflects these constraints and one that the planning officer considers reasonable. Um, we hope that you will grant our application as we've actually requested it, and I'm happy to take any, any actually questions you have. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions of Mr Mitchell? Uh, Councillor Cooper, Rod Cooper. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, could I um, just, uh, for my own clarification, uh, go through the timeline uh, as it as it stands at the moment and, and then hopefully uh, uh, establish the actual time that it will take. So in in my, uh, the notes that I've made here to uh, drain uh, to repair the bank drain and sort everything out we're looking at a month for each of those processes uh looking at it realistic is it would, would you agree with that yes i would yes, yes scenario okay so um assuming uh, and also the other question i have um did the october the third event have any significant impact on the water level uh, coming from the uh, from the river to, over to the quarry, did that increase uh, the levels at, at, to any degree? It is, yes, it did. Uh, we had noticed before that that river levels were dropping. They've now topped up again. That's why we had uh, land and water out again to have a look at it, and that's why they raised their concern that the river levels would just carry on being topped up over the whole winter period because of further rainfall, which then would delay the works into early, early next, 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 next year. Okay. Then that, then that falls into the fish spawning season. And we've got additional delay then, and then we have to complete the working and restoration after that time frame. This okay. is the reason why we had the discussion about what could be an appropriate time frame and two years seem reasonable with those constraints. OK, can I just t t take you back then, if I may, to the um, to, to my timeline, uh, mm. if I may? So we're talking uh, um, um, probably January, if there's no more significant rain, January, February for the um, for the level to drop. So then you've got a, basically a three month window to get the repairs and, and the and the quarry pumped out. Uh, uh, and then from there, you you um, you have um, roughly 12 months work to extract the remaining uh, um, agreed sand. Um, is that we, my, my timelines about right? That we have 12 to 18 months of sand remaining okay. at, at the site. Right. So that that then would would take you effectively to your to your extension. It would. Yes, it would. Yes. Okay. My last question. Um, uh, have you done any future scoping? Yes, we have. We've been open and honest with the liaison group about potential future extension. It's only a small extension area. 
Uh, that's the purpose of the actual liaison group is to discuss current operations and future thoughts. Um, if we make a planning application in the actual future, it will be up to Hampshire County Council to decide whether it's acceptable or not. Okay, okay that, that's all I have, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. In relation to the, your last question, I draw members' attention to paragraph 72 of this report. Um, can I move on now to uh, the last deputy is uh, Councillor Mark Kemp G, um, who is now welcome to address this committee. Oh, apolog apologies, Chairman. I think Councillor Warwick wanted to ask a question. Sorry, I know. Right. Yes, you've just come up. Yes, Councillor Warwick. No, thank you, Chairman. I, I could have waited, but I, I'd like to just ask my question briefly. And I just wanted to thank both speakers for being so eloquent. Mr. Davey, you gave a really good perspective from the residents' point of view. And Mr. Mitchell, I think you were very thorough. I just had a quick question about um, Kingsley Parish Council requested perhaps that. that only a one-year extension could be given, and I guess this follows on from Councillor Cooper's questioning. Is there any chance, if, if you extract sufficiently, that you would, would close down operations early on site? Um, I don't think we could, really. Um, this is the reason why we've asked for the two-year period. Any earlier closure would actually need to be able to allow us to do the works immediately, and we can't at the moment. We are very much constrained by the by the actual weather, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Councillor Warwick, um, I may be wrong here, um, but having read the report on this one, um, it seems to me that somewhere in this report, it mentions the fact that uh, Water can't be, no work can effectively be undertaken on the site until probably July next or August next year because of the fish spawning um, operations, which that, that is where the timeline, I think, starts. I may be wrong and somebody can correct me if I am. That, that's my response to your question. Yeah, and I think, Chairman, I think that's helpful to clarify that so that they're not starting from now, essentially, are they? <laughs> no, they're not, no. Yeah, thank you. Um, right. Uh, any other questions of either of, of, of uh, Mr Mitchell? No, right. Well, then, in that event, we move to Councillor Mark Kemp G. Mark, floor is yours. Um, good morning, Chairman, and Thank good morning, you. members. Thank you very much for allowing me to address the committee as the divisional county councillor. I like very briefly. I, I don't think I'll take the ten minutes, but I, I know you'll forgive me very briefly by starting off with a couple of commendations for Grundons. Firstly, to thank them very much for the exemplary way that they have run the or uh, helped us run the liaison panel over the past few years um which is very much appreciated um they've done that as i said in an exemplary fashion and secondly i would like chairman to thank them very much for their community engagement which has been so important to us in particular for their support for the kingsley center which looks after 60 young adults with exceptional learning disabilities and they have managed to keep it going with that we have kept going with grundon support during the lockdown period i cannot tell you how much respite care and all other types of care um, in this day center has been for these very disabled as i said 60 um, young adults with these terrible disabilities and um, a really heartfelt thanks for me on that. Um, also, I'd like to thank uh, Philip Millard for his report. I will take him to task over one conclusion that he draws, but his factual um, accuracy cannot be um, doubted. It's just his, one of his conclusions I disagree with. So thank you, Philip, for all the support you've given to us over the years as well. Um, I'm afraid 
you know, that's a nice place. Now Mr. Beastly has to take over a little bit, but I wanted to get those facts on record. Um, firstly, I'm going to ask you to rein back a little bit on the sympathy vote for the flooding. I resist in saying pouring a cup of cold water over it. In fact, uh, Chairman, this site has flooded before. It flooded actually in October 2000, uh, but that did not affect the sand pit or the quarry, big quarry as it is now, at the west, as the west end of the pit had not become fully excavated. There is a strong body of local opinion that says it should not have been a surprise, but by taking the huge excavation so close to the riverbank, Given the flood uh, record, and I quote from Grundon's application in 2005, um, from application F306-33012, to be precise, um, on their own map, the, flood, the floodplain was very well delineated. So in summary, Greed took the pit too close to the riverbank. Surprise, surprise, it broke. I'm afraid that is a strong body of local opinion. Um, therefore, in a sense, the residents feel that this misfortune is somewhat of their own making. Moving on, Chairman, for the local residents and indeed for others involved, although there are only some, I think, 17 dwellings within 500 or meters or so. If you were to move the array, if you remove the diameter back a bit, you bring in a significant further number of dwellings. And just across the A325 is, of course, the hamlet of Frith End in the Binstead Parish. You will note from the maps of the quarry there is an important footpath that ran bang, runs bang through the middle of the quarry. And that is an important feeder footpath for residents of Binstead into Alice Hope Forest in the National Park. And this quarry is right on the edge of the National Park. Formerly, this was, of course, a very pretty piece of rolling farmland in which this footpath went through. And of course, the residents want it restored as quickly as it, they can, although it will never ever be the same, of course. Mr. Millard refers to the important strategic nature of sand, and unfortunately, time and time again, soft sand is associated with silica sand, and silica sand, as we know, has this strategic uh, connotation. This was a strategic connotation given in wartime, I believe, to silica sand. Uh, because of its importance in glass making, which is no longer required. Let me tell you where the silica, so-called silica sand goes these days. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of tons are dumped on golf courses and football pitches. And whatever your sporting predilection, I hardly think that that can deserve the strategic uh, connotation that it has. In point of fact, Silica sand is just a form of soft sand. Soft sand is not in the short supply that it was. I know I've seen you look at other applications uh, for soft sand quarries in the north. This is recently in the north of the county, over between Winchester and Romsey, another one very recently. And thirdly, of course, permission uh, has been given for that soft sand. Uh, Approximate to the new forest purple haze, and we are delighted to say that Grundons has been awarded the contract for the purple haze quarry, and it is their intention to shift the kit from uh, this this quarry in Frith End down to purple haze in the relatively near future. The chairman has touched on uh, paragraph 72. But the trouble is, when this first came to the liaison panel, and indeed to the County Council, this application was totally in conjunction with another one. Now, uh, Mr. Mitchell has referred to a small extension of the quarry, 
So in other words, we're not just talking about extraction from below where it's flooded, but a new extension, a small extension. It just happens to be an amazing topographical and ecological and environmental important hill that has been protected for 30 years by us from being excavated and destroyed. What he may consider a small extension to us is possibly the most valuable piece of countryside left in the quarry surrounds and will be bitterly fought over, bitterly fought over, if any attempt is made to destroy that hill, Ranks Hill. And let me get that right into the public domain now. So here we have it. This isn't the bus that never comes, Chairman. This is the bus that never leaves. For 30 years, we've been standing at this bus stop. And it's pretty annoying, I can tell you. So I think the reasons for the extension are pretty sketchy. I think they've brought it upon themselves to a, a degree. Um, they've behaved well. Um, I agree with you there, but there is something up their sleeves. They've told us what it is. We don't like it. We know what's coming. And therefore, I ask you to treat this extension with very grave suspicion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Cantley. I always enjoy listening to your representations. They're brilliant. Um, members, do you have any questions of Councillor Kempty? I've got an, uh, Councillor Philpot, and then I've got another one come up. Councillor Philpot first. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Can I echo that? I always like listening to Mark, and uh, and I think he's uh, what an outstanding uh, councillor he is. I. I I, can I just say uh, a question, Mark? Um, you said that this area flooded in the year 2000, and uh, and since the year 2000, the uh, the pit has encroached closer to the riverbank, and as a result of the uh, of the the deluge that there was in February 2020, it's uh, it's burst its banks. Now that could have been, you say, could have been predicted. Can I just get some clarification from you? Was was that predicted, or, or did people say in advance? Did any residents, did uh, did uh, any officers, did anybody at all, in fact, um, make any comment or representation, warning that the closer the pit got to the riverbank, the more likely was the chance of uh, of a flooding event? I, I I think if I may, Chairman, through you, Councillor yeah. Philport, can I suggest for the sake of um, and a very good question, but for the sake of, of balance, perhaps you, it might be better if you address those questions to to Mr. Millard or indeed Mr. Mitchell, if that would be permitted. Um, I, I, I do have photographs here on my desk of the 2020 flooding. Um, I, I believe I'm right in saying that it, it is in a floodplain and it was carefully noted in the 2005 application. It is, of course, a matter of opinion how close you dig a big pit to a riverbank. It may be that uh, the Grundons received advice saying, you know, you can go as close as that without being endangered. But the fact that it has happened was no surprise to the residents. That I am certain about. And they did think after the flooding of 2000 that it was a risk, yes. I, thank you, thank you, Mark. I think Mr. Millard, Philip Millard, has been making notes as we speak. So, uh, so we'll be interested to hear his views later. Thank you. Right, I can see another hand up. I'm not sure who it is at the moment. Chairman, it's Councillor Quantrill. All right, Councillor Lance. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kemp G. In your preamble, you complimented Mr. Millard on his report, but you said there was one factual conflict. Tell me what it is, please. I did say I think it was a conclusion, not a fact. Um, conclusions are often... No, I'm reading your, your words here. One factual conflict. <laughs> Tell me what it is, please. Um, I disagree with you, Council Consul. I didn't refer to a factual. I referred to a conclusion. Would you like to tell me what that is, please? Yes. The conclusion was that there is a, when he links the shortage of silica and soft sand in one sentence, in fact, they are different, 
it is the silica sand that is said to be in short supply, although it is uh, used extensively on golf courses. And soft sand, I refer to the other applications that I'm sure you're aware of, Councillor Contrell, in the north of the county. Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. And in Romsey, Romsey, and you'll be aware of the huge purple haze development. I think if you looked at soft sand as a whole, including silica as soft, that the shortage is not as acute as uh, as uh, Mr. Millard seems to suggest. Thank you. I have that point, and I I have to um, admit an interest. I have bought thousands of tons of silica sand for golf courses. <laughs> <laughs> well. Then you're a lucky chap. Right. I think we've come to the to, um, to the end of questions of. Oh, does anyone else have any questions of Councillor Kempke? It would appear not. So we now move on to asking of members whether they have any questions of Philip Millard. Um, Philip, members, do you have questions of Philip Millard? Councillor Philpott. Same, same question that I, uh, as, as I was asking Councillor Kemp G. Did anybody predict that uh, digging a quarry so close to a riverbank would cause it to burst its banks? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so in 2007, uh, that was the um, the current permission that we're, we're working from, uh, and that was the one that gave granted permission. It also included a uh, extension to the south of the site as it was at the time and sort of brought it into the current uh, relationship with the river. Um, it is acknowledged that um, you know, also at that time, um, part of the extraction area is within um, you know, the flood zone of that river. Um, that should be pointed out in that topography of the time when that application was considered in 2007. Um, as part of that process, the Environment Agency, who is responsible for main rivers, as well as um, uh, specialist consultants on, on flood management within the council would have been consulted. Um, the local lead flood authority, which is the current um, consultee we have, wouldn't have been around at that time, uh, 13 years ago. And so that would have been considered then. Um, uh, and at that time, the planning authority and you know, it, more importantly, the environment agency would have been satisfied that the risk of flooding to the quarry wasn't significant enough to uh, refuse that that planning permission at that time. Um, so, for, fast forwarding to now, uh, we have a situation uh, which, um, you know, circumstances have changed, and there are differing uh, flooding uh, impacts and potentials. Um, and we now do sit with a, a policy in our plan, which wasn't in 2007. Our plan came in 2013 which includes the uh, the Climate Change Policy 2, which looks to um, not only uh, prevent uh, impacts uh, that uh, an application or a development may have on climate change, but also to uh, build its own resilience to uh, the changing occurrences of, of, our, of our environment. Um, and so to return back, we're, we're here to consider uh, whether two years is uh, a reasonable amount of time in, in planning context to allow the applicant to, to repair damage to a flood. Um, this application doesn't um, include any additional works to uh, further prevent future flood events. Um, you know, obviously, they're, they're in regular conversations with the Environment Agency, and I'm sure they would be guided uh, about that or not. Um, we're, we're quite satisfied as a planning authority that um, the, the, the communications and the contacts that the applicant had and the operators had with the environment agency is a good working relationship and um, you know, they, they've been acquiring the permits and, and following the guidance of the environment agency as the environment agency has given them. Thank you. You happy with that, Councillor Philpot? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone else have any further questions of, of uh, Philip Millard? Apologies, Chairman. It looks like Lisa would like to add something. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, Chairman, I'd just like to come in on a couple of points that have been raised um, earlier this morning by members. 
by the deputations, just for clarification more than anything. Um, the first one is in relation to the differences between soft sand and silica sand. Soft sand is considered to be an aggregate under the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Plan policy, so under policy 17. So it's considered to be different to silica sand, um, which is considered to be a non-aggregate. That is why there are separate po policies in the plan for aggregates and silica sand. Now, the, the site where that's in question today um, is basically classified as including both soft and silica sand. So we have a requirement to um, have a land bank for the soft sand element of the site, but we also have a requirement to ensure a supply of silica sand specific to this site. Now, I understand Councillor um, Kemp G's comments about the use of, um, of, of silica and for recreational uses, etc. However, national policy is very clear on silica sand and does not distinguish between glass making and other recreational or other uses. <coughs> Hence why we have to have this requirement for 10 years um, set out in the plan. So that's the first element. The second element is that we've, we've listened today about the referencing to the scoping report that was recently issued about potential extension of this site. This is not something for us to consider as a committee today. Um, any potential extension of the site um, would be considered on its own merits at the time of submission. What we're considering here is the um, potential re restoration and the further extraction of the remaining reserves and essentially the repair of the site. So it's a very, very, um, you know, a dis important distinction to make. Whilst we recognise what Councillor Kempchi is saying about concerns about the potential of extension of the site, that is not for um, consideration today um, or indeed any reference to the site at Purple Haze, which um, is not um, an application that has been submitted to the Minerals and Waste Planning Authority at this stage. So that's probably enough from me at the moment, but I might chip in on a few of the other issues if it comes up in members' questions, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lisa. That point you last made is, of course, contained in paragraph 71 and 72 of the report anyway. Thank you for that. Um, I think we've now dealt with all questions of oh. the... Apologies, Chairman. I have um, Councillor Hughes and Councillor Carter both have their hands up. Okay. Councillor... Hughes first. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, one quick question for Philip. Philip, um, thank you very much for the report and the briefing. It's really, really interesting. I just want one point of clarification, if I may. When I read that the uh, there was a, an inundation into the quarry caused by an overflowing of the river, I, I've not read anywhere in there to say that the Environment Agency have said that the practices in the quarry uh, contributed to that particular event. Would that be correct? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Y yes, you would be. The, the operations in the quarry has not had uh, any uh, effect on, on, on the river itself. So the, the flooding of the quarry was the river's fault, I suppose, if you want to put it one yeah, way. Yeah. As um, I, as I, as I, that's how yeah, I read it. Yeah. It, thank it, you it for cut that a, clarification. It, it cut a trench through the, the field next to the quarry and, and penetrated the, the lip of, of the, the, the quarry pit. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Hughes. Uh, Councillor Carter. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, um, with regard to the flooding, we, we do, of course, have unprecedented rain levels um, um, at, at this moment. Um, I seem to have lost my picture. Can you can you see me? We can, can hear you, you, Chairman. Yeah, you can just can see it. Anyway, you can't see me. Um, and, and I'm having to be in my conservatory at the moment where it's raining hard. Um, I... Um, Philip, do, do we know the, the the width of the of the break of the of the river? And uh, uh, this may be a question to the Environment Agency. When we have these um, extra high um, rainfall that Im impacts our rivers, rivers naturally look for a floodplain. So, if this break is repaired, that river is going to flood somewhere else. Um, so, has that been considered? Um, the, the, the quarry is a natural floodplain that doesn't impact upon residents. But what will happen in when future um, uh, uh, terrific rainfalls, the, the river is going to flood somewhere else. Ha, has that been considered? Uh, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, if you just bear with me. I was, I'm, I'm just going to uh, bring back one of the photos that was in the presentation, um, which... Uh, 
should be able to just see now on your screens. Um, you first asked about the sort of width of the, the breach. Um, I can't give you exact figures, and it's it's probably quite um, a, a a variable. But I mean, from this photograph, you can see that you know it's in the region of five to ten meters there at the lip of the site. Um, it, it cut through the the um, ground material on the topsoil of, of the uh, field. Um, it was sufficient to to fill the quarry in quite a short period of time. I believe it was about a 24 hour period. Um, it was the next day when uh, we were contacted by the operator to and show photos. Um, uh, we had a liaison panel again, uh, probably in quite short time after the flood. I think it was in March, um, uh, where, where uh, the operators are, are sort of shared um, images and photos. Uh, you also raised a question about the have we considered uh, flood impacts or knock on impacts to, to other developments. Um, in planning terms, we're here to consider um, the repair of a quarry. Um, the, the flooding or flooding risk addition that the current permitted development may or may not have was considered in the permission and would have also been considered in the extension that was granted in, in 2017. I should clarify, extension of time, not geographic extension, in 2017. Uh, and so, therefore, um, you know, the proposed works in order to um, repair the quarry back to as it was um, should have no additional flood impact uh, further down river in respect to, to planning. Um, the other part of that is the Environment Agency. And so the Environment Agency is responsible for the river and they will have fully considered that within the, their consultation um, for the site uh, as specialists in the river and they would have um, been aware of, of the process. Um, the approved uh, operations that occur on the site at the moment do include uh, pumping water from the quarry back into the river. That's the process in which they're going to use to help uh, to remove the water from the, the new um, the flooding event. Uh, and they'll do that in, in a way that's agreeable with the um, Environment Agency to not incur those dangers. As I said, it will be um, really a matter for the Environment Agency to deal with. Um, as a planning authority, we are satisfied that um, yeah, the, planning, uh, the Environment Agency has considered that issue of flooding in this, in this case. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. So I, I don't think we have got any more questions of Philip. So we move on to debate now. Uh, does anyone wish to debate the merits of this application? If not, it, oh, okay. somebody's, somebody yeah, wishes. Yeah. That's Lerod Cooper. Lerod Cooper, right. Uh, so thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, I'd just like to share uh, uh, um, some thoughts that that uh, I've come to the conclusion on. <coughs> clearly, clearly that the the flood has, uh, situation has has got to be resolved one way or the other. It it, it can't be left the way it is. Um, and I think it, it would only be fair to allow the operator to excavate what they are were originally permitted to do so in, in the previous planning permission. There are a number of alarm bells ringing in my head with regard to this, um, but as far as the, the, the permission itself is concerned, uh, I don't see we have any alternative but to, to extend it for a period of time. Now, whether that should be for the two years, I, I, two years from the timeline that I've written down chimes reasonably well. But uh, as I say, I, there are some reservations in the back of my mind on this one. Right, OK. Um, Councillor Hughes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, it seems to me this is the second pragmatic uh, report that's come to us today. And I think I have to agree with Councillor Cooper, we, we, we should approve this extension. But I would like to make one observation. The wonderful thing about working virtually is that you have access to devices while you are listening to the debate and the reports. So I have in front of me my MacBook Air, another iPad and another iPad. So sustainable development is all about three pillars, social, economic and environmental. 
I just confirmed with uh, Mr Millard that the Environment Agency had no concerns over what happened to cause the inundation of the quarry. We recognise that the, e the economic value of the quarry to the Hampshire Waste and Minerals Plan. And then we talk about the social side. If you go onto one of the House Prices websites and you look at Frith End Road and Pickett's Hill, which are the two roads very adjacent to that quarry, house prices there are some of the highest in Hampshire. We're talking in the millions. And I would contend that for a quarry that's been there for 30 years, it cannot be having such a social impact that's impacting on house prices and the, um, the, the livelihoods and quality of life of the residents that live there. It's obviously an attractive place to live. So on that basis, this quarry is fulfilling its responsibility for sustainable development, and this extension will allow that to continue to its natural conclusion. So I support the recommendation as on the paper. Thanks, thank you, Councillor Hughes. Um, anyone else wish to debate this? If not, I think we can move over to the recommendation contained on page 33 that planning permission be granted subject to conditions listed in Appendix A. And I think subject to uh, something which was contained in the updated report from yesterday. Um, so subject to that, can Katie, can you now take over for the vote? Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to confirm, um, I understand that um, yourself and Councillor Leith, um, Councillor Franken, were both taken away from the meeting temporarily whilst the deputations were um, speaking. So it's probably best if you both abstain from voting on this item. Um, if there are any other members that um, feel they haven't been around for the whole item, then they will also need to abstain. So I will just go through and do a roll call vote just to, to make that clear with the voting. So, um, Councillor Carter? For. Councillor Mark Cooper? For. Councillor Rod Cooper? Yeah, for. Councillor Frankham? Abstain. Thank you, Councillor Frankham. Councillor Gibson? Uh, for. Thank you. Councillor Hare? For. Councillor House? For. Councillor Hughes? Four. <clears throat> Councillor Irish. Four. Uh, Councillor Latham. I'll abstain, although I was present. Thank you, Councillor Latham. Councillor McAvoy. Four. Councillor Penman. Four. Councillor Philpot. Four. Councillor Price. Abstain, so I nipped away for a short time. Thank you, Councillor Price. Councillor Quantrill. Four. And Councillor Warwick. Four. Thank you. Um, those recommendations are, are carried, Chairman. Thank you, Katie. So that is passed. And that, I think, then concludes the meeting. Thank you to everyone for attending. Um, and thank you for all the debate. It was uh, a good meeting. I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, at the uh, training session at the end of this month. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you.